Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 3G NY Stories Live, We Do Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Alexis Fishman. I'm a former board member of 3G NY and the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors from Hungary and Czechoslovakia. I'm thrilled to be here tonight for 3G NY's 18th We Do Wednesday. Tonight, we are really excited to feature guest speaker, Daniel Riff, who will share the story of his paternal grandfather. We welcome all of you who are tuning in for the first time, as well as those of you who regularly participate in our programs. We're so grateful for your support and grateful for the opportunity to share these very important stories. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for the grandchildren of survivors and our supporters. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and lessons of the Holocaust. Founded in 2005 with a group of just six, 3GNY's membership is now at 4,800 and it continues to grow. Over these past 15 years, we've held diverse programs of all sizes around the New York area. 3GNY has also played a leading role in launching other 3G groups, including 3G DC, 3G New Jersey and 3G Philly. And we're in conversations with others around the country to expand our reach even more. Tonight's We Do Wednesday program showcases 3GNY's flagship educational in initiative, We Do, which is short for We Educate. We Do is a training program that empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their family's Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. 3GNY has trained over 300 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Washington DC, and of course, most recently around the country on Zoom. In 2020 alone, we trained 62 grandchildren, more speakers than in any other year. Also in 2020, between speaking in schools, our live programming and our YouTube channel, more than 10,000 people have heard our stories. And in total, throughout WeDo's existence, more than 30,000 students have been impacted. Hope is not lost, but we need to keep doing the work. You can help us do that through a financial gift of any amount. This will go directly towards training more speakers and thus reaching even more students. We don't solicit donations from schools, teachers or students. We provide our programming to schools completely free and we aim to keep the cost of training to 3Gs as low as possible. There is a link in the chat with ways to donate and we hope that you'll consider making a gift. If you've already donated to us, thank you. We really, really do appreciate that. Uh, and to everyone, by just being here tonight, you're helping us to honour the memories of our grandparents and ensure that never again is more than just an empty phrase. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Rebecca Weintraub, We Do volunteer, who will share some remarks and formally introduce you to Daniel. Thanks, Alexis. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Weintraub, and I'm the granddaughter of two Holocaust survivors. Both of my father's parents were survivors. My grandmother came from Bruchsia in East Prussia and my grandfather came from Tarnograd, Poland. I feel as if I've always known that I was a 3G, even if I didn't have that term to describe myself with back in the day. But that being said, my family never really spoke about the Holocaust. My grandmother, whose story I tell through We Do, wasn't forthcoming about her wartime experiences and my father followed suit. Sadly, my grandmother passed away in 2002 before I managed to work up the courage to ask her about her story. And it was only when I finally got my hands on her Spielberg interview 10 years later that I learned the complete and horrifying details of what she went through. At some point, I decided that if she could no longer talk about what she experienced, even if she had wanted to, and my father wouldn't, then I would. I couldn't let my grandmother's story fall through the cracks and be forgotten. Hers and all survivors' stories deserve to be heard, especially with the survivor population dwindling. And that's why I joined We Do in January 2019. I finally got into my first classroom last month when I told my grandmother's story virtually to a class of eighth graders in the Bronx. It was such a positive, incredible experience, and I look forward to speaking to more classrooms in the future. Fun fact, tonight's speaker, Daniel Riff, who I'm very excited to introduce you to, was the other virtual speaker in the classroom that day. So I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to hearing his grandfather's story tonight. Daniel is the grandson of four Holocaust survivors. Since 2013, he's organized Yom HaShoah programs to help people find connection and meaning in learning about the Holocaust. And he joined 3GNY's We Do last fall to put the full narrative of his grandfather's life together to share with students. He also recently created a presentation based on his maternal grandmother's story of survival. Daniel grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and currently lives in Brooklyn. He graduated from Washington University in St. Louis and is currently a program manager at CLEAR helping offices and public venues reopen as safely as possible. 
Daniel, take it away. Thanks so much for the introduction, Rebecca and Alexis. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Riff, and I am really honored to be able to share my grandfather's story with you tonight, my Zeta Morris. I participated in the We Do training program last fall. All of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and my grandfather's story is one of two that I've become very familiar with, thanks to an audio interview that my, he recorded with my dad in the, mid, in the late 70s and a video testimony that he recorded in the mid 80s. I know that he wanted his story to be heard and understood, and that he'd be very grateful that all of you tonight uh, are taking the time to, to hear his story. And tonight, we'll be telling it together. I was lucky enough to get to know my grandfather toward the end of his life, playing catch in my yard and visiting him and my grandmother often when they lived near me. He passed away when I was 16, and while I would have loved to have had more time with him, I'm so grateful that I had any time with him. Auschwitz was a concentration camp, as we all know, that the Nazis used to imprison and kill Jews and other oppressed groups during the Holocaust. But Auschwitz was not just the name of the camp. It's also the name of the town that camp was next to. And that town, Auschwitz, or Oświęcim, as it's known in Polish, was my grandfather's hometown. Morris Riff was born in 1922 in Oświęcim and was the oldest of five kids. Here you can see his grandmother, his parents, one of his sisters, and his brother. His dad was a monument maker who mainly made tombstones, and they didn't have much money, but he said they had what they needed. He had lots of family in the town, and his fondest memories were going to his grandparents' house every Saturday afternoon after synagogue with his family and his aunt, uncle, and cousins. The town had about 14,000 people, and about 8,000 of them were Jewish. Here you can see Jews in front of the great synagogue in Oishvenshem. He attended both Jewish school and public school, sometimes both on the same day. Jewish school was to pray, learn Hebrew, and study Jewish texts, while in public school, he probably studied much of what kids today study in the US. At age six, he would go to the Jewish school at 7 a.m. for a half hour of prayers, run home, have breakfast, then go to public school at 8 a.m., then home for lunch, and then back to the Jewish school until 6 p.m. Starting in seventh grade, he attended a public school where there was a lot of tension between the Jewish and Catholic students. Many of the Catholic students would call the Jewish students' names and beat them up, and the Jewish students would fight back. Anti-Semitism was common in Poland during this time. Outside of school, he was very active in Jewish youth organizations, and he dreamed of one day going to what was then called Palestine, and today is called Israel. It seemed like an impossible dream that there could be a Jewish state where things would be better for him. Here you can see a picture from around that time where he's standing with a group of friends. In the summer of 1939, when he was 17, there was talk of Germany invading Poland and a national mobilization effort began to prepare. In Oświęcim, Polish officials came into synagogues while Jews were praying and ordered them to dig, ditch dig ditches for the army to hide in. For my grandfather, that was the moment he realized that something real was happening. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, which was the start of World War II. A few days later, my grandfather's dad was supposed to take a train to work at 6 a.m., but at five, the Germans bombed the train station. Oświęcim was at a major crossroads for train lines from all over Europe, as you can see these railroad lines intersecting there. So the Germans chose Oświęcim as one of the first bombing sites to disrupt the train traffic. 
While thousands of residents fled the town immediately, his dad insisted on their family staying because it was hard to travel with young children and because they had limited money. His dad also thought that the invading Germans would treat them well, since the Germans who had occupied the town 20 years before, during World War I, had been nice, educated, and liberal. But very soon, there were signs that this occupation would not be as mild. He watched as the first Germans entered the town and began chasing some of the Jewish boys. He knew this was a bad sign. And soon after, the Nazis burned down the great synagogue. He and some other Jews somehow learned in advance that they would do this. So he helped bury the synagogue's Torah and other valuable items below it. Jews were no longer allowed to own businesses and they had to wear white armbands with stars of David. In this picture from 1940 on the left, you can see my grandfather in the back row wearing his armband. Once the, Nazi, once the Nazis occupied the town, Jews could still live in their homes, but the Nazis would search Jewish homes every few days, taking anything valuable. And the Jewish men, young and old, including my grandfather, were required to report for forced labor every day. On the right, you see a picture of Jews in Oishvensham digging ditches during this period. In the spring of 1940, an officer from the SS came to the Jewish committee in Oishvensham, which the Nazis had established to have the Jews police themselves, demanding a group of 200 Jews who would show up at 7 a.m. to work. Otherwise, he would murder the Jewish leaders in the town. My grandfather and his father were among those selected. The officer marched the group outside the town to an area that had been a Polish army camp and ordered the Jews to clean up the site, disinfecting and preparing the barracks. There was just this one Nazi officer with a dog, a whip, and a gun, and he alone created abusive, terrifying working conditions for the Jewish laborers. My grandfather and his dad worked as sign painters, so they were the first ones in the world aside from the Nazi leaders, to know what this site was going to be. His dad painted the first sign that said Concentration Lager Auschwitz, which meant Auschwitz concentration camp. He couldn't imagine the horrors and death that would happen there, but he knew it wouldn't be good. He also painted signs for the buildings, ones that looked like this block four sign. Once the first transport of 10,000 10, prisoners arrived, my grandfather and the other Jewish workers were dismissed since these new prisoners would provide the labor going forward and the Jewish locals weren't allowed anywhere near the camp. After a few months of waiting around with nothing to do and forbidden to travel anywhere, in November, 1940, the Jewish committee announced that the young Jews of Oishvenshim had to go to labor camps. Nearly 300, including some girls, were brought to a big hall where the leader of the local Jewish community told them they'd be going to a camp for six to 12 weeks. And then they'd come home and be replaced by other workers. Although my grandfather says he didn't believe that. He tried to look on the bright side. This was an opportunity to prepare for the labor he hoped to one day do in Palestine. But before he boarded the train along with two of his cousins, he said goodbye to his parents, his sisters, and his brother. He shared his story in this recording much later in life, and I will let him talk about that moment. All the parents and families gathered around that building, wanted to see their loved ones for the last time. This was the last time I saw my family. When I said goodbye to my mother, she fainted. I jumped out from the march and I held her and I helped carry her in into the building. But she was revived. And she says to me, I hope to see you someday again. 
That was the last time that I saw my family. The train took him to a labor camp about 70 miles away in another part of Poland that Germany had occupied. He got up at 4 a.m. every day, marched more than an hour, and then spent eight or nine hours chopping trees, clearing the way for the Autobahn, Hitler's project to build a network of superhighways. You can see a group of Jews photographed on the left who were building the Autobahn. He says that life was bearable because the Germans were winning at the time. That meant the Nazi officers were in a better mood and that they would continue to need Jewish labor. But he realized that his suspicion had been right and he would not be sent home as promised. And when it got too cold to chop trees, he would march up to 20 miles a day to clear snow from the roads, just like you see in this picture on the right. After a year in that camp, the Nazis closed it and sent prisoners to other camps. He would spend the next year in four different camps, working outdoors or in factories, and at each one, things got worse. There was more brutality and less food. In late 1942, he arrived at another camp, another labor camp, Hirschberg in German territory. He worked loading wool into freight cars and he would march through the city to get to work, passing ordinary Germans going about their everyday life. Here's him recalling that experience. Whenever there was nearby a camp, if it was a labor camp, a concentration camp, people were taken out to work, to, bo to build streets, to work in factories. We told them, we screamed, that we are Jews. To help us, they looked the other way. They knew what's going on. I'm sure they did. While he was at Hirschberg, he learned that Germany had expelled all Jews from Weisvenschem and that his parents, sisters, and brother went to a nearby town and were forced to live in a ghetto. He was still able to receive letters, and his sisters wrote him to say that his parents, brother, and his oldest sister had been sent to the Auschwitz camp and were likely killed. Eventually, the letters stopped and he heard there had been an uprising in the ghetto where his sisters were, and that the Jews were killed. He knew that he was likely the only living member of his family. At Hirschberg, things got much worse as the Germans started to lose the war badly. Up to this point, he'd still been able to wear everyday clothes, not a prison uniform, and his group would receive rewards when they worked hard. But now, the SS came to take over the camp and transformed it into a typical concentration camp. He watched as the Nazis surrounded the camp with electrical barbed wire, and they cut what he called a road in his hair, shaving the middle of his head so that he'd be recognizable if he escaped. The Nazis were beating him on the way to work, at work and on the way back, and even the Germans who had guarded the camp before and knew how hard he worked were shocked and people started to die of starvation, mistreatment, and disease. By March 1945, he could hear artillery fire as the American army was getting closer and closer, and he knew the war would be over soon. The Nazis retreated, marching the Jews with them. For two days, my grandfather walked in what was called a death march, where he received two pounds of bread for two days, and if he got weak, he'd be shot. He described passing the beautiful scenery, mountains and rivers in springtime, but passing lifeless bodies in ditches as well. And things were about to get much worse. The next morning he wakes up and he and a thousand other prisoners are forced to board a train of cattle cars with little food. You can see here what these cattle cars look like. There are 50 people in this car. He doesn't know where he's going or how long it'll take, but he knows the Nazis are losing badly, so they won't need him alive as a worker for much longer. 
In that cattle car, he can't stand because the two Nazi guards fear an uprising if they allow the Jews to stand. He can't lie down because there are too many people. He can't go to the bathroom or he can, but he has to just go in that car filled with people. He's passing through the countryside, but he's also passing through large cities. It's freezing cold. And since the cattle car has no roof, he's covered in snow. But he says he's fortunate to be covered in snow. He runs out of food after two days and has no water, but he can lick the snow. He licks the snow and that helps him stay alive. One morning in that cattle car, he wakes up and realizes that some of the others suffering around him are dead. Maybe they died of hunger or of thirst or of cold. It's impossible to know. And the bodies of the dead remain in the cattle car with the increasingly weak bodies of the living. So those surviving make the most of the situation. He said, we gathered the dead at the end of the car. Some people slept on them, using them as head pillows to put their head down. Some people sat on them. It didn't matter anymore. We were all so used to that, that it didn't bother us at all. He thinks he'll die too, not from the hunger or the thirst or even the cold, but from the cramps he feels sitting down. He sits in that cattle car for one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, and he survives, reaching the next camp, Buchenwald, the eighth camp he'd been in, 250 of his fellow passengers, a quarter of the Jews who had boarded that train after surviving for years of Nazi terror died during those five days. Arriving at Buchenwald, the Nazis immediately cut all of his hair and took him to the bathhouse where at least he could drink the water. And again, things were even worse. We were given new fresh clothes and we were sent to the barracks. And the barracks, these were wooden barracks where there were three, like, like tiers. tiers. And every tier was divided for five, for five people. So we were laying one next to the other. Just wood, no blankets. We lay in our clothes. Most of the people that came with that transport had frozen parts of their body. I had my toes frozen. Some had worse of freezings. There we got once a day a bowl of, of, of soup, cabbage soup, and a piece of bread. People most of the people ate it in one shot, and then they were going around hungry and wild, and they ate grass, and they ate whatever they could pick up to survive. I personally was always able to control my hunger, and I divided and I split it, but I had to watch that piece of bread, keep it on my body, under my shirt, because otherwise it was stolen from me by other prisoners. People were dying by the hundreds around him and death seemed certain. Here you can see pictures of prisoners at Buchenwald during this time. While he's not in these pictures, as far as I know, this is probably what he looked like at age 23. He was then taken to two more camps over the next few weeks, hearing sirens indicating that the allies were bombing the area. He knew he was so close to the end of the war, but he was sleeping in a tent five bunks high with the little that was left of his body being eaten by lice. The Germans continued trying to kill the prisoners through exhaustion, 
marching him back toward Buchenwald. While they were stopped at night, he heard another siren and the Germans ordered them all to lie down in the field and the Nazis began shooting. My grandfather was shot in the shoulder, but he was so weak that he said it felt like a tickle and that he felt warm blood covering his body and he fell asleep. The friends he was with carried him the rest of the way to Buchenwald the next morning, and he went to the barrack for the sick. Every day the guards searched the barracks and sent any Jews somewhere else. So he and a few friends would, would move some ceiling boards and hide in the attic. One day when he was hiding, he suddenly heard screaming and people crying. He and his friends came down from the attic and found out that Americans were surrounding the camp. It was April 11th, 1945, and he was liberated and cried more than he had in his life. But this was not the end of his struggle. The well-intentioned Americans gave him great food to eat, but his body couldn't handle it. He had diarrhea so bad that again, he thought he would die and his bullet wound became infected, but he recovered while still living in a nightmare. I lay in the hospital about four to six weeks. I was there. And then I started thinking about my family. Is there anybody alive? And if they are not, what purpose? Why should I be saved? I went through a terrible emotional trauma. I cried a lot. I had dreams. Sometimes I didn't know where I am, who I am. I was walking around like in a daze. Good thing that I had a couple of good friends that didn't go through what I went through and that helped me, watched over me. The Americans gave him the option to stay with the Russians who were close by or to follow the Americans as they moved deeper into Germany. He and two of his friends from the camp chose to follow the Americans. He went to a displaced persons camp in Germany, but after a few days decided to go with a friend back to Poland to search for his family. After traveling for four weeks, some on foot, some by train and some hitchhiking, he reached Oishvenshem. It was a terrible shock for me to come back home, to come back to my hometown. When I came to the center of town, I didn't see any Jews. I was used to see Jews all over. I met some young men my age that I went to school with, that I went to school for seven years together. They were shocked to see me alive. They say, you're still living? I thought they killed you all, they killed you all. I didn't know what to say. I asked for my relatives, for my family, among the Gentile neighbors, and they told me that there is a couple of Jewish boys standing out there, they pointed out, and they said they will know more details, who is here. <clears throat> there are some Jews here. I found out that I have three cousins that survived, that were in the camps with me, and we were separated, that went in the camp with me in the beginning. They survived. This was the first day that a little bit of happiness came back to me, that I have somebody that I'm not alone. I tried, started to ask around if anybody of my close family survived. I found out nobody survived. Of the 8,000 Jews 
who lived in Oshvensha before the war, about 90% were killed in the Holocaust. After a week in Poland, checking nearby towns for any sign of his family, he couldn't stand it anymore and returned to Germany. After a few months, he got a job working in a kitchen for the US Army. You can see him in uniform here. He shared an apartment with his friend David from the camps, who reunited with a cousin who had also survived, Esther Weingarten, and introduced them. I'm very grateful that David made that introduction, as Esther is my bubby Esther, my grandmother. Both of them had lost their entire family, and they quickly fell in love and got married in January 1946. They had a son later that year, my Uncle Bernie, who you see here. In 1949, my grandfather's uncle, who lived in Chicago and worked as a monument maker, helped them secure visas to move there. They came over on the USS General Blatchford, arriving in Boston and then taking the train to Chicago. Here's a picture of the ship and a page of the manifest from that journey. You can see both of my grandparents listed at the bottom. They were 27 and 25 at the time. His occupation is listed as stonemason and their sponsors are listed as Wolken, his uncle's last name, and HIAS, the organization that many of you are familiar with, which still helps refugees resettle in the US today. Two years later, their second son, Joel, was born. That's my dad. They had little money, had to learn a new language and a new way of life, but eventually my grandfather found a job as a painter, painting houses and apartments in the Chicago area. In these pictures, you can see him at work and with his family. In 1976, he and Esther achieved his once impossible dream of moving to Israel where they spent seven years, but returned to the US to be near family when their first grandchild was born, my brother, Adam. He returned to Chicago for the rest of his life, aside from a few years when he and my grandmother lived near my family in California. That's me in front. He passed away in 2004 at the age of 82. In 2009, I visited Auschwitz. I saw where the great synagogue had once stood and where 70 years before, my grandfather had helped bury the Torah before the Nazis burned it down. You can see a candelabra, which was discovered buried there in 2004. I walked down the street he grew up on, trying to figure out where his family's apartment had been. It was tricky since some of the street names and numbers had changed. I was with someone who spoke Polish, but I was scared to ask for help, unsure of how the locals might react. Would they be angry, ashamed? To my surprise, each person we stopped to ask was eager to help. And we suddenly had a small team debating and walking with us around the town. We decided that his building may be this one on the bottom right. Today, that building is the city hall of Oshwensham. Morris is no longer with us, but his sons, three grandchildren and two great-grandchildren are. Here are my niece and nephew, Sona and William Moses. Moses was my grandfather's Hebrew name. Thank you so much for listening to my grandfather's story. He would have been very happy that you heard it. Daniel, thank you so much. Um, it's just amazing how no matter how many of these stories you hear, they're just all um, so moving and important. And I just want to thank you for a beautiful presentation. Um, we're going to take questions now. As I see there's a bunch that uh, people have already put in. Please don't be shy. Throw them in. We'll um, do our best to answer as many as we possibly can. Um, and if we don't get a chance um, to answer the questions, don't worry. We'll forward them to Daniel um, on email and see if we can get an answer for you. Um, uh, first question from someone is, how, how do you have all those beautiful photos? Where do all those photos come from? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so some of them are from uh, 
Some are from relatives, some are from uh, our archives that other survivors or other people that live in Auschwitz from before the war, those pictures made it through. Some are at the Auschwitz Jewish Center, um, but a number of them are just uh, our, our family photos. Um, some of them were taken, we have lots of photos that were taken in the DP camp after the war. Um, but before the war, I know there were a lot of pictures of Jews from the town and he was in some of them. Um, so that's where that's where several of those pictures uh, come from. I don't know that he kept any of those photos on him throughout the whole time. I would be surprised um, if he was able to, but I know that many are from the uh, archives. Um, which of your, another question we have from Allison Rudolph, which of your other grandparents' story do you know, and will you tell that story in 3GNY? That's a great question. Um, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, the other one that I know well is my mom's mom, um, my bubby Sonia, who had a very different experience. Um, she was from, uh, uh, I mean, it's like the border of Ukraine near, near Poland. Um, and she was never in camps. She was in hiding throughout the war. Uh, so she was moving around from barn to barn um, initially with some of her relatives um, and, and a couple others, but eventually on her own uh, and, and survived. So uh, her story, I, I um, did a similar presentation through the Museum of Jewish Heritage, also has a, a program um, for uh, 2Gs and, and 3Gs. Um, but I would be happy to, to share that presentation wherever as well. And I, I will also mention that uh, I will be Esther, my um, Zeta Morris's wife, who I mentioned um, in this presentation, uh, actually through the research I was doing for this presentation, um, going through the tapes that my dad had recorded, we realized that uh, there was actually audio of her telling her story as well. Um, which we hadn't realized. So my dad has been going through that and we've been learning more about her story. We have a question from Alan Chernoff, who uh, which is also a question I had, Alan, so thanks for asking it. Um, were the buried Torahs ever recovered? Uh, that's a great question, Alan. Um, I don't believe so. Uh, I know that the there were artifacts that were uncovered I don't think the Torahs were. I know I've I've asked this before of the Auschwitz Jewish Center, and I don't think that those have been found, although there was a very extensive excavation done there maybe 10 or so years ago um, under the Great Synagogue. Um, we have a question from Hetty Bohm. What, um, I think she needs to say when and what decided to, like, what made you decide and when did you decide to tell, like, that you had to tell the story, that you wanted to tell the story? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I, maybe five, seven years ago or so, I started organizing smaller Yom HaShoah programs, first just sort of among friends. And that was mainly... Um, I've gone through so much Holocaust education in my life of all various forms. I've been to a lot of Yom HaShoah events and I'd often struggled for it to like feel a strong connection um, and not feel like desensitized to it. And I figured if I felt that then people with no family connection probably felt that much more so. Um, so I saw it, I saw an opportunity for myself to kind of be a bridge and help people personally connect to it. At first, not really connected to my family story, but just, connected to learning about it in uh, new ways. Uh, so I put together different types of programs every year. In terms of sharing their stories, it hadn't, uh, so I started learning more when I went to Europe. I studied abroad in Prague uh, in college and did a Jewish studies program while I was there. Uh, and so that's when I first started um, learning more about my family's history than just a little that I'd known before that. Um, and then I heard about first the, the program at the Museum of Jewish Heritage and thought it was an amazing opportunity um, to speak in classrooms. It hadn't really occurred to me to do that before. Uh, and then I heard about the We Do program as well um, and was able to put together two presentations for two of my grandparents. Um, Daniel, there's a bunch of questions about how you came to learn this story. Sort of firstly, um, was it all from your grandfather? Were you able to um, get information from the International Tracing Service? How did you find all the great information? Um, handful of questions about that. 
Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a mix. I didn't hear any of it firsthand for my grandfather, as far as I can remember. Um, the most amount of time I spent with him was around when I was seven or eight. Um, and he lived until I was about 16, but he also had Alzheimer's for the last several years of his life. Um, so I didn't hear the story from him directly. Um, I, most of it came from the interview my dad did with him um, in the late 70s, uh, where he talked about um, his experience before the war and up through liberation. And then uh, this video of testimony that he did in the mid 80s was also very helpful. Um, and he gave a lot more detail uh, in, in that interview. And then a lot of it was searching online for records. Um, it was sort of a, a team effort within my family. A lot of people were looking at different databases to try to find information. The manifest was new for us to see. Um, also found information on my grandmother and camp she'd been in. So some of it was more recent research, but almost everything was from his testimonies. Um, we also have a question. Is your grandfather's video testimony archived at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum or the USC Shoah uh, Visual History Archive? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I'm So it is online uh, through, it was done, I forget the name, but it's an archive that was through Yale or a project that was through Yale. And uh, the actual recording is housed at the Holocaust Museum in Skokie outside of Chicago. Um, I don't know if it's within um, like the Yad Vashem um, database of, of any sort. I know that uh, my grandmother on the other side, her testimony is through the US Holocaust Memorial Museum I and mean, is on their website or is, is available through their website. Um, but his is, uh, his is available through the museum in Skokie but the actual testimony was done through the project at Yale. And a question from Adele well, yes, who's for, asking- Yes, Fortune, Fortune, Fortune Off Archive has someone helpfully put in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. A question from Adele uh, asking whether your father or you ever went to any of the um, commemorations of the anniversary of the liberation of Buchenwald, which is apparently something that the Buchenwald Foundation pays for. That's good to know. Um, yeah, I uh, I have not. I don't think um, my dad or my uncle have either. Um, I know that um, one or both of them accompanied my grandparents to some of the gatherings of survivors, especially like in the 80s, the large, large gatherings that happened. But in terms of going to the commemoration at Buchenwald, I don't think so. But I would certainly be interested in, in doing that. Um, how difficult, Leon asked, how difficult is it to tell the story over and over? What's the most challenging thing about this experience? Yeah, so I'm still pretty new at this. Uh, I went through the training in the fall, and this is the third third uh, group, I would say, that I've, I've spoken to and shared the story with. I've also done a couple presentations for family and friends, um, share with them, and also to kind of get comfortable with it myself. Um, I did expect to get less emotional each time I did it. And instead I've gotten more emotional each time I've done it. Um, so I don't know if that's going to continue. I'm hoping it doesn't continue to get more emotional than it is, it is now, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoy sharing it. Um, and I really enjoy sharing it with new audiences, new groups, one of the groups, the first group that I spoke to beyond friends and family was uh, a middle school group, um, of course, virtually uh, in the Bronx. And I was like very surprised afterward that uh, like several, I, I was in the chat with them. We were all in like the same Zoom chat and they were all like asking their teacher if they could like see more of the videos. So I sent the teacher a link to the uh, website where you can watch it. This one is public, you don't need to request it. And the teacher the next day wrote me saying that like all like a lot of the kids had watched the 90 minute video like that night and then like told their parents about it, um, which I did not expect to happen. So uh, I 
that that was amazing and hopefully that that is relatively common i don't know maybe it's just that one class but um that definitely makes it very worthwhile uh so i'm excited to speak to more groups um daniel there's a question here from yael and yael actually this is um I'm really glad you raised this because this is definitely something that 3G and I would love to know more about. The question is, have you ever virtually presented to a local high school in Oshvenshem? The descendants group for my ancestral towns in Poland have partnerships with local schools there. So yeah, we definitely want to talk to you. Um, but there's one little question for you there, Daniel, and I actually just have a follow up question um, about Auschwitz too, but maybe you can first just answer whether you've ever virtually presented. Sure. Yeah, I, I love that idea. Um, I have uh, connected to the Auschwitz Jewish Center, um, which is, uh, I'm sure they are connected to the schools there, um, but I haven't asked them about that in particular. Um, when I went to, when I studied abroad in Prague, we went to Poland on our, like, uh, our spring break trip um, was to go and visit Poland and go to campsites. Um, and we were, our main guide was from the Jewish Center there. So uh, they've been very helpful in like information and research uh, and they're trying to track down which building he probably lived in. So that's another question that I can ask them is if there would be an opportunity to present, I would imagine through a translator um, uh, to, to the students there could be really interesting. Amazing. And I just have a quick follow-up question about Auschwitz. I mean, it's so, um, I, I don't know anyone who's family is actually from Oshvensim and I was just wondering whether either for your grandfather or for you there's um th th there's sort of any level of additional trauma that you know Auschwitz is the kind of most well-known sort of the symbol of the holocaust and whether there's sort of a, a you know a, a, whether your grandfather ever spoke of a, of a you know a greater amount of trauma in knowing that this has ha this happened in his hometown that is now forever you know tainted yeah that's I, I wish I could ask him that um and I, from what I've heard and that he's, that he's said, I haven't heard him speak to that in particular, um, but I will definitely ask my, my dad and uncle after this. Um, when I hear Auschwitz, I still think of the camp. Um, to me, Auschwitz and Oishvenshem are two like pretty separate things uh, in, in my head. So I still think of the building at the entrance where the train goes through um, when I hear Auschwitz. Um, and I don't necessarily think like my grandfather's hometown. Um, so yeah, to me, they still feel, they still feel pretty separate. Um, I, uh, I do wonder, you know, given, especially given that he was at that site, obviously forced labor, helping, helping to prepare the site like how much that's that stuck with him um and i i don't know the answer um another question here given how horrific your grandfather's experience was did he have any challenges adjusting to life in the united states and or israel yeah uh, i i i'm i'll be honest i am not sure um i mean i know that he I mean, wasn't familiar with the language, didn't have much money. Uh, I'm sure that was really difficult, especially until he landed a stable job. Um, I know that he also, and he continued to have nightmares for the rest of his life. He was someone who generally uh, was able to keep his emotions in check. Um, and I don't know if that's something that he learned when he was in camps or if that's just sort of how he was by nature. Um, but he did, he was certainly carried the trauma with him, um, for the rest of his life, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's as much as I know. Um, Daniel, what, what was your grandfather's philosophy after the war and what did you learn from him? Meaning what, what, what was his sort of vibe like and, and was there, was there a, an outlook that he had that you could share with us? Yeah, uh, so I, I was, my memories of him are mainly from when I was around, of him before he experienced what he experienced at the very end of his life, um, or really from around when I was seven or eight. And what I remember is um, him being very kind, uh, very warm. Um, and 
I remember him being upbeat. Uh, that's that's how I remember him. Um, so I don't know if that reflects on all of his life in in the U.S. after the war, but that's that's how I remember him being with me toward the end of his life. Um, did your grandfather only start talking about his story later in his life, or did he talk with his sons about it? I should I should know I should know more of the answer to this one. Uh, I think he I mean he did he didn't like hide it from um, my my dad and my uncle. I don't know at what point he started talking about it more. Um, I I don't believe it was you know immediately after after he arrived. My grandmother on my other side, who I did another presentation on, was pretty unusual in that like still in the fifties she was going around telling her story. Um, she told it pretty immediately, which I know is, is not common. As far as I know, with my grandfather, he wasn't, you know, going out and sharing his story actively, um, very much, uh, but it wasn't something that he, it wasn't something that he never talked about. Um, but that's also a, a good question that I'll ask my family. Uh, we're going to take one final question, so I'm sorry if we didn't get a chance to get around to um, answering all of them. Um, the final question is, Is did your grandfather uh, ever go back to Europe or Poland and, and did you know, he ever have the desire to do that, to go back to, um, to visit Europe? Yeah, I don't think he went back. I don't know if he may have gone back to Europe. I don't think he ever went back to Poland. Uh, I, both my dad and my uncle did. Um, and I think he was like comfortable with them doing that. They may correct me on that, but I think he was comfortable with them doing that. Um, but I don't, I don't believe he ever went back. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so much, so, so, so much for speaking tonight, um, and sharing your grandfather's amazing story. Also a big thank you to Rebecca for being part of the program. Um, and thanks again to all of you for joining us. We're really glad that you took the time to hear Daniel tell a story that must never be forgotten. Um, if you haven't yet made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope that you'll consider making one now. Please refer to the chat for the ways that you can donate. We really do appreciate that. Um, also, if you have any connections at all with educators who may want our speakers to present to their classrooms, please, please let us know. We have a really large speakers bureau of grandchildren ready and prepared to present, just like you saw Daniel do tonight. And we really hope to see you again soon. On Wednesday, the, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern, our friends at Liberation 75 are hosting a global gathering of Holocaust survivors, descendants, educators, and friends with a special featured event for 3Gs called How Being a 3G Has Impacted My Life. And additionally, we'll be hosting more We Do Wednesdays on May 12th and June 9th. Um, tomorrow, we'll be sending out an email with details for these events and for others, as well as a recording of Daniel's talk from tonight. And you can also check out our past We Do Wednesday speakers and other events on 3GNY's YouTube channel. So um, thank you again to Daniel and thank you all for taking the time out of your evening to be with us. We're so grateful as always for your presence and support. Good night.